Good afternoon, everyone. It is so good to be in person. I love teaching in person. Okay, I see some of you still have their masks on. Feel comfortable, however you wanna, you know, proceed with the semester. Okay, um, and talk to me about any concerns you might have. This is Chemical Engineering 2450 or Numerical Methods. So make sure you're in the right class. Um, this is also known as the has a bad reputation, this course. It's like tremendously difficult, um, they say. But most of your colleagues who went through the course, they're like happy after they get out of the course. Because we measure success in this course by taking note today of what you know, and then at the end of the semester, what you know then, and then you take the difference. If you learn something, then you did a great job and I helped you get there, okay? That's my objective. My name is Tony, or Tony, I'm from the Mediterranean, so Tony Saad, pronounced Saad, Saad, however you like. You can call me Dr. Tony, Professor Saad, Professor Tony, however you like, okay? And I will be your teacher for this semester. This is a very important course in your chemical engineering education, in your engineering education. Okay? Because in this day and age, if you do not know how to talk to computers, how to talk to data, how to process data, how to analyze it, you are not going to be competitive in the job market. Whether you're being an engineer or a faculty or a researcher, you need to be able to reason with data and reason with computers. What that means is that we're going to be dealing with some programming. Okay? We're going to talk a lot about that. What can you do with numerical methods? Let me turn off the lights and try to show you some of the stuff we did during the COVID pandemic. This is research from my group, the Utah Computational Engineering Group. Um, and what you're looking at here is a full-blown airflow simulation of the Utah Symphony at Abravanel Hall. If you already live in Salt Lake. You've probably heard of the Utah Symphony and Abravanel Hall in downtown. If you're new to Salt Lake, you should totally check it out. Beautiful, beautiful place, beautiful venue, amazing orchestra. During COVID, orchestra shut down. Why? Because of those nasty wind instruments. They are aerosol generators. They put this instrument in their mouth and they play it. And there's a lot of respiratory droplets that aerosolize from those instruments. If you play, does anyone play a wind instrument here? Yeah, okay. You clean up your reeds, right? You, um, so it's an aerosol generator. And the symphony at the time was worried, the orchestra was worried about COVID transmission from wind instruments, both towards the other musicians and towards the audience. While string instruments and the pianist or the percussions can be masked, it's unrealistic to mask a wind instrument. Okay, they try to do these masks on, it just destroys the acoustics, the beauty of the sound and all of that good stuff. So we went there and we wanted to look at what's going on. So in this first simulation on, the upper, on your upper left, what you're looking at is the standard orchestral arrangement and the color you're seeing is particle concentration. This is respiratory droplet particle concentration. I'm um, ranging from 10 particles per liter at the highest, the red, all the way down to 0.1 particles per liter, right? But if you're continuously exposed to a concentration, especially if it's virally loaded, then you might get infected, okay? So because aerosols are transported by airflow, we said, okay, let's study the airflow. If we study the airflow, we can understand where the viruses go. So we went, took their original orchestral arrangement. You see the percussions in the back. Some, some of these cylinders here are not emitting anything because they're string instruments. Some of the others are emitting things. They're, you know, you have the trombone, you have the flute, you have the bassoon, you have the oboe. They had a total of, I think, 16 wind instruments playing. And just looking at the particle concentration, in this numerical simulation. This is done with numerical methods, guys, okay? This is numerical methods. What you're learning here is the first step to be able to do that, okay? And if you decide to do a PhD, come talk to me. I'll be happy to take you in my group and you can learn about how to do all of that. 
Now, what you're looking at the bottom is we said, okay, well, I don't care if there's a billion viruses up there or down on the floor. I'm not going to breathe those. What I worry about is my breathing zone. So we took this region from um, about chest level to slightly above head level, and we averaged the concentration over time and vertically, and this is what we got. You see the three flautists over here. So the flute is emitting from both spots at the end of the flute and near the reed, right? And this is terrible. This is really bad. These particle concentrations in red, you're talking about 100 particles per liter. This, these are the trumpets over here. Trumpets are the loudest and they are the biggest emitters, but they don't shoot as far as the flute, for example. So what did we do? I'm not talking to you, Siri. Okay, so what did we do? We opened the doors on the side of the stage. Now this building, just like this building and the Utah Symphony building at Bravo Hall, they're compressed. They have higher pressure inside than the outside. When you open a door, air is flowing from the inside to the outside. They are designed that way. Okay, unlike residential homes where you, know, you don't have much pressure difference between inside and outside, buildings for comfort, you design it as pressurized. So we leveraged that fact. We said, okay, if we open the doors, we're gonna create a new way to get rid of the potentially infected aerosols. Imagine you're driving an Uber and you know, one of your riders is smoking a cigarette. You tell them, go in the back, you open the windows, right? And you blast the AC to get that smoke out. This is what we did, but that wasn't enough. We went ahead and rearranged the wind instruments. We placed them way in the back near, near the return vents and along the sides near the doors. And this is what happened. We reduced the average concentration just by doing numerical analysis. We reduced the average concentration by a factor of 100. And lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, the Utah Symphony was one of two symphonies in the U.S. out of 316 national symphonies. These are big symphonies who had its doors open in September 2020. Okay? We were very proud of that. We went there, and I told them, look, I will stand there and take off my mask. There were no vaccines even then. It was like early on in the pandemic. And I have a person at risk at home, and I was willing to put those results where, put my money where those results are, whatever, whatever that statement is, okay? And then the New York Times called us, and so we had an interview with them, so that was fun. You can read the article there. Anyway, that's what you can do with numerical methods. Now that I wet your beak a little bit, we can go to the boring stuff, right? To, you know, you need a lot of prep to get to that point. So that's what we're gonna do in this course. We're gonna do all of this prep to get to that holy grail, okay? Now, I need to mention something. There's a big event going on in the Catmull Gallery. You hear some noise over there. Um, there's a huge donation coming to the College of Engineering, and I think they're gonna rename the college. Um, and we need to support the college and show presence. So the dean's office might send someone to call upon us to see if you'd like to go and participate to fill the Catmull Gallery because Governor Cox is gonna be here. So we might get interrupted uh, for about 30 minutes. Um, if, you, if that person comes in and asks us to go, feel free to go and participate. I will stop the class if even one person leaves, okay? And then once you're done, um, then I'll go with you, okay? Once we're done, we can come back here. Apologize for that, but we wanna support the college as well because those donations end up being funneled through financial aid and TAs and other things. That is the uh, only interrup interruption that might happen today, okay? Um, the objective today is just to get you to know me, um, get rid of my jitters. Every time I stand in front, I still get my heart racing and I know you all do that. So the recipe to that is to go for a run before you teach a class or before you have a presentation. Then you don't know why your heart is racing. Is it because, you know, <laughs> you're standing in front of a lot of people or because you exercise a little bit? But I want to get you to know me a little bit and introduce you to our great TAs and talk about the syllabus, the expectations from this class, kind of fairly easy. Um, before I start that, I would like to introduce you to your TA, TAs this semester, um, Nicholas Baker and Brooke Boone. 
Um, they were uh, my students last year, and they loved the class so much that they wanted to TA um, this year. Um, so they will be your go-to people, um, including me. And I will explain to you the process of, you know, asking questions, you know, after hours and uh, contesting grades and all of that other stuff. Um, Nicholas and Brooke are going to be kind enough to do four help sessions um, for you on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I will also explain that. And um, let's get started. Okay. First, we get rid of the, we get over the administrative stuff. Um, let's see. This good? Just dim enough so that you don't fall asleep. But don't worry, I'll raise my voice at some point and we'll wake you up. So, okay. This course is entirely going to be on Canvas. So this is my primary means of communicating with you. Make sure your email um, is connected to Canvas. You get any announcements, notifications. I will post homework assignments over there. I'll post study guides, um, exam guides, everything. I will communicate with you through Canvas email. So make sure that that is not going to spam. Okay? I will make every attempt to record these lectures. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So I have a plus Canvas plus YouTube. So I host all the recorded lectures privately on YouTube, and I link to them um, through Canvas. So this lecture is done. I go to the office, convert it to MP4, upload it to YouTube, put the link on Canvas, and then you can see it on Canvas. You can bypass all of that um, by going directly to the YouTube channel, which I'll show you in a second. But this is an in-person class, and I do expect you to come in in person. Um, there is no, no Zoom option and I will make every effort to record the lectures. Sometimes technical difficulties arise, like, I don't know, my batteries die and there's no audio, okay? Thankfully, there's years of previously recorded lectures, and while there is change from year to year, the content is similar, so, and you'll have access to all of those um, uh, previous year lectures, so, you know, you miss lecture 10 on, uh, the Tomas algorithm, you can pick it up, and I didn't record it for some reason, then you can pick it up from last year or the year before or the year before that, okay? Um, all, uh, all recorded lectures will be posted on my YouTube channel. Um, you can go to youtube.com, Professor Saad explains, and please sign up to the channel, okay, so that you get notifications. There's a ton of other stuff, okay? Um, there's a ton of other stuff. You can look through all of those simulations that I showed you before. There's a playlist entirely dedicated to the COVID study um, with, uh, uh, with, the, with an interview and an author explainer and a bunch of other things. And, you know, you know you'll get to see the, uh, all the numerical methods lectures, okay? Um, I will send email to the class uh, via Canvas. So this is the primary means of communication. Um, I have student hours, I don't call them office hours because they're really your hours, right? They're not for the office, so they call them student hours on Wednesdays and Fridays from 1 to 2.30 p.m. My office is on the second floor MEB, okay, 2286. It's on the syllabus. Um, so just come in and talk to me. This is open door. And if you're walking around, my door is open or, you know, knock and I'm there and you want to talk, chat, I'm happy to, to, to talk to you. Um, if this is course related, like um, homework or uh, technical content, please come prepared. Um, the last thing you want to do is come and fumble, oh, I have a question, but let me pick up my notes, etc. I'll tell you, hey, go to the student ICC, collect your thoughts, and come in so that, because I want our time to be productive, right? I don't, I don't want us to spend five minutes figuring out what the question is, and then you get tired and I get tired, right? So come in prepared with clear questions, okay? And you're welcome to sit in the office and like work on something and then ask another question, et cetera. That's totally fine, okay? And you can do appointments um, for sure. And I'm happy to meet with you by Zoom if you're uncomfortable um, meeting in, in person. I'm happy to wear a mask if you want me to wear a mask. That's fine, okay? Um, we will have four sessions, two on Tuesdays and two on Thursdays. Um, why Tuesdays? Because your home, uh, your sorry. Why Tuesdays? Because it's two days before the homework is due, and why Thursdays? Because Thursdays is when the homework is usually due. Okay, so um, 
that's over the years, those two days have been the best days where we get the most attendance. When we do sessions on Wednesdays or Mondays or Fridays, all we hear are just crickets, essentially. So these are the best days to optimize um, for timing um, for m most students to come. And we found that in the afternoon is usually the best time. Um, if you still need help because you might have a job or you have some other course, your schedule doesn't allow it, then we can do that through Canvas email communication or through Canvas discussions, which I will also talk about here. So this year we're going to try out what's called Canvas discussions. So on Canvas, on the left menu, there's something called Canvas discussions. I've never tried that. You probably are more of an expert in that than I am, but let's give it a shot this year. Okay, you go post a question on Canvas. You all are expected and allowed to chat with each other, explain concepts to each other, and work on homework with each other, okay? But don't copy each other blindly. At least, you know, change the name, like when you make a copy. Um, and, you know, there's gonna be a lot of coding in this course. And I personally learned coding by going on Stack Overflow or like, you know, code Stack Overflow, copy a piece of code because someone did it so well, and then I learned from that. So when you copy a piece of code from your colleague, change it, rewrite it. You know, look at it, change it, rewrite it, try to learn, because your objective is to learn something new, not just to go through and get done with the, with the homework. You wanna learn something new that you didn't know before, okay? Um, there is, I do not expect you to purchase a textbook. Um, I'll give you a lot of class notes and material and even chapter excerpts um, from this textbook as PDF, so you don't have to go and buy it, but you can borrow it if you want from the library. This is the book by Chopra and Canali, Numerical Methods for Engineers. Great classic numerical methods book, really any edition. Um, so they have a lot of problems in, in that book, and I inspire from those problems, so if you feel like you wanna push yourself more into understanding the material, etc. cetera. Um, so you're welcome to, yeah, grab a copy and um, work on the problems, and I'm happy to help you with that as well, okay? All right, homework assignments. There will be up to 10 assignments this year. Um, the assignments will be posted on Canvas as a PDF, so I'll give you the problem statement, um, the assignment statements, two or three problems usually. Okay, they will be posted on, um, ca on Canvas. I expect your submission or your report, your answer, to be also uploaded on Canvas. And if you don't know what Jupyter Notebooks are, that's okay, we'll discuss those, we'll dedicate time to discuss what those are, but your solution or your report is gonna be returned to us, uh, myself and Brooke and Nicholas, because we will all be grading your homework. Um, both as the original Jupyter Notebook and a, P and a PDF version of that notebook. Okay, the Jupyter Notebook is nothing more than a glorified Python code that allows you to put text and code together. So in the past, we used to ask you to write code in MATLAB and then create a plot, then copy the plot, put it in a Word document, and then if something changes, you gotta get, rerun the code again and go to your Word document. With Jupyter Notebooks, you don't have to do that. It's all in one place. You can put your name, you can put a discussion, you can put headers, you can put import figures and write code in one place. But I ask of you to format it correctly and cleanly, and we will also discuss, about that, discuss that. That's an expectation for homework assignments. So you will submit both the Jupyter Notebook, which essentially contains the source code, okay, for your solution, and a PDF version of that notebook. I'll show you also how you go. You go file, print, or export as PDF, and you just submit both the PDF and the original um, notebook, okay? Homework is usually assigned on Thursdays and is due a week from Thursday, okay, the following Thursday. Um, no, we, f we found over the years that sometimes I used to do 12 days for homework, sometimes 10 days. Um, it didn't matter because I know you will work on your assignment on the, in the last two days. So seven days seems to be a reasonable time to give you a weekend um, between um, the assignment and the due date. Um, there's a 25% daily penalty for late submissions. 
unless you coordinate with me sooner. So this policy is explained clearly in the syllabus. I encourage you to go read the syllabus. It's linked in the Canvas front page. Um, and it's a live syllabus. It's constantly updated on Google Drive. So you go um, look at it. Make sure you understand that policy clearly. Um, if you have a CDA form or accommodation, um, let, I should receive those as soon as possible. And uh, you'll get no more than three days extension because that's going to meet the 25% penalty late submission. And oftentimes, I solve the homework a couple of lectures after it is due. Um, so the solution will be discussed in class, okay, because there's going to be coding involved and I need to go through the coding with you to explain my th thought process and have you participate in the solution. Um, if you re need to request an extension due to circumstances, life happens, you know, and so please discuss with me as soon as you can and no later than three days after the homework is assigned. Um, uh, for assignments, you will receive little partial credit and I'll discuss that in, a, in the next slide. The reasoning, and many of the things I do in this class, um, uh, I failed at doing them when I first started teaching. But then you go and learn about proper um, pedagogy and um, teaching methodologies. Um, I'm trying to strike a balance here between having you work with a long period of time where you're not under pressure, but you have a chance to get the answer right, and also work with under pressure, such as exams or quizzes, um, and maybe commit a mistake, but you'll get a lot of partial credit. So with exams, you're going to get a lot of partial credit. With homework, I expect you to try to get the answer right, right? because you have a project. You're going to be in real life one day. You're going to deliver. Um, on projects and frankly when when it's something real that is going to impact people you're going to feel so nervous about your answers like is my bridge design going to work is that gondola going to work so you better you know we want to develop that muscle in your brain that yeah i can i can do work that i can trust a hundred percent you know so that i can go and stand on the utah symphony stage without a mask on without a vaccine with a person at risk at home Okay? And two babies, right? So all of that. That was early on. We didn't know anything about COVID. So you need to develop that muscle. Okay? And you have plenty of years to develop that. So it's good that we're doing this here in this class. Right? It's good that we're doing this here. I, I am 100% happier if you make a mistake here in this class where, you know, the stakes are so low. Right? You're not, it's not hurting anyone. It's just starting a discussion then making it when you are out there and your neck is on the line, okay? All right, so what was next? Your submitted Jupyter notebook has to just run when executed. So essentially, when you finish your code, when you do your homework, make sure it all runs, execute it all runs, and that's it. Save it, download it, and upload that, okay? Because we're not, although we're not going to run your notebook, we're not going to debug your code for you, if there's something that's kind of off between your PDF version and the notebook, we're going to open up the notebook and see what you did. And if it doesn't run, but in your PDF it has a different answer, that's going to raise questions and, you know, becomes... It rarely happens, but just make sure your PDF version and the uploaded version are consistent with each other, okay? Um, we will not be able to debug your code. 60 students and 10... Uh, hundreds of thousands of lines of codes, it's an impossible task. And I really don't care. This is not a programming class. I don't care how you write your code. If it's a thousand lines or five lines of code, I don't care. I want to help you learn to write more efficient code. But let's get driving the car first before we understand how the engine works, okay? So your objective here is to solve an engineering problem. This is not a computer science class, not a programming class. I care less about the variable definitions or how you create an array. If you want to push further, great, I will help you and we'll throw in some tips and tricks for coding in the class, but that's not the objective. I'm not worried about Shakespearean style coding, whatever that means, okay? Okay, um, it is your responsibility to make sure that your notebooks are complete and can be executed without error, so that goes into that previous point. Okay, now, 
Assignments must look and read like a regular report, except that they will have code in them. So that's the blessing and the curse of the Jupyter Notebook. I know many of you have dabbled with Jupyter Notebooks. Can I get some hands up if you've done some? OK, that's a great count. Awesome. You know, when we first switched to Jupyter Notebooks in 2017, um, no one had even heard of those um, early on. So now I'm glad that many of you have been exposed to them. So, you know, it's a kind of blessing and a curse because you get complacent. You just use it as a coding platform. And then you come back to a notebook two years later, like, what the heck am I doing there? Instead, you should always treat the notebook as a note-taking platform that allows you to write code. I am the first person who commits this error. You should see my notebooks and my research. I'm like, I get back to them, like, what am I doing here? I have literally no comment except that, hello, or you know, I miss the kids or something like that. But it's just all coding, right? So don't make that mistake. So hopefully by putting that expectation on you in the homework assignments that, yeah, run the code, get a result, but explain it. Okay, I will upload a homework template for you, a homework assignment template to see kind of how, what I expect of you, okay, in those homework assignments. In, in real life, well, this is real life, but in like, you know, post bachelor's degree life, you are going to be expected to write reports to your clients, to your boss, to your colleagues, right? And that needs to reflect um, quality and cleanliness, right, in the, in the structure of the report, right? So they need to be readable. So they need to read like a report, not just code, okay? Print out, this is a critical thing. Print out statements regardless of how descriptive they are. So let's say you run a code and you print out the error. My error is whatever, percent I, uh, et cetera, the, the variable name. That does not count as a discussion. That's just a code printing out something. You need to take that value, create a new notebook cell under it, text cell, and write it down and interpret it to me. Don't just, I don't want a number. I want what is behind that number. That's why engineers, you'll see you're gonna be making big bucks because you not only can make a number, but you can interpret it, okay? That's what I'm after, really. That's what I'm after, okay? Formatting should be clean and clear, et cetera. We talked about that. Okay, so if no, here, here are the two rules for notebooks. In, ho in the first homework, we're going to be very lenient, okay? You're going to botch it up. It's fine. We're going to just give you comments and tell you, look, next time, make sure you add more discussion. Because in a way, it's a subjective standard, right? Like, what is a good, properly formatted report? I, I really don't know, right? But uh, when I see it, I can tell, right? So that will get teased out in the first homework. Okay, we do the first homework, you return it to us, we'll tell you, look, you need a little bit more discussion over here, make sure in homework two, you include that, okay? And then by homework three, everyone is on board, hopefully, and you know, we got it all um, sorted out. If you don't provide the discussion, these are the rules, okay? This is like our agreement. If no discussion is included and we cannot interpret your results, so let's say you have code and print statements, but no discussion, but we couldn't interpret the result, then you will not get any points on that question. Okay, not the entire homework, just that question. Because you might, question three, you might not do anything about it, but you might have discussion elsewhere. So this will apply for question three, for example. Now, we will make an effort to interpret your results. So let's say you have a bunch of print statements or a plot, and we can interpret it, then we're like, yeah, you know, you almost got it right, except you didn't discuss it, so we'll give you 50%. It's just as simple as that. To be on the safe side, every time you get an answer, write something about it. I'm not asking you to write a Dostoevsky novel, okay? Just write one sentence. The error here was 15%, and it was twice the error when we used the first order method. That's it. That's all I'm asking. Or someone else might say the error was 15%, and it is higher than the first order method. Great. That's it, okay? That's what I want, okay? A lot about homework assignments. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, this is, the, um, this is the partial credit policy for homework assignments. Again, my reasoning 
And I want you to understand why I'm doing this. I'm not doing it out of spite or to be mean. It's just putting a standard to try to balance expectations from you, okay? If the method is correct and no errors, you get 100% credit. If the method is correct, but you have a typo, like we could identify a low minor arithmetic error in the code, for example, you had a minus instead of a plus, or you had multiplication by n minus one instead of n, you know, something minor like that, um, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna, we're gonna take 20% off. Now again, that might sound high, but that's only for that question, which in the grand scheme of things could be like 2% of, of the grade for the entire homework, okay? Again, the goal is to get you to a point where you can interpret your answers and results with enough time that you can get it right every time you're gonna get it right because you have a lot of time to get it right, okay? Now, if you have a minor theoretical error, theoretical errors are more dangerous because that means that there's a conceptual issue that you missed, okay? So we will deduct 40% for a minor theoretical error. A major theoretical error means you got it entirely wrong, okay? And you will not get credit for that, okay? So then we would have to work at getting, revising the concepts, and that happens, you know? I was horrible, my, my worst subject was probability and statistics. You look at my, my um, transcript, like I had like a C or something on probability, and, and I had a horrible teacher, and I didn't like the subject, so anyway, I like certainty, but um, anyway, so it happens, okay? There are some topics you're gonna love and enjoy. There are some topics you're gonna be like, yeah, I don't get it right, or you know, I didn't teach it well or something, and that's okay, you know, it's gonna happen, but you have 10 homeworks, it will balance out, okay? It will eventually balance out. Okay, we will hold regular quizzes on Canvas here in class. So we'll come here and tell you, hey, we got a quiz, and this might happen in the middle of the lecture. I'll explain why I do it in the middle of the lecture or by the end or randomly. Um, these quizzes are to test your qualitative understanding of numerical methods. Like what are the benefits of using a relative error versus an absolute error, right? Or what is the purpose of approximate error? Why are iterative methods more effective than direct methods for solving sparse systems? Little questions like that. Sometimes they'd be multiple choice or you have to write something, okay? Very short, like two, three minutes, okay? We'll have plenty of quiz, they'll count for 10% of the grade, okay? So that's just qualitative understanding of the material. Okay, we will have three exams and a final and your first exam is gonna be next Thursday. Oh my gosh. However, it's gonna be on like prerequisite stuff. Like, you know, adding two vectors, adding two matrices, um, taking a derivative, like, right? The prerequisites for this course will be 20 minute exam, will be here in class, okay? And I will send an announcement today explaining, giving you a study guide, um, some material to study and prepare for the exam. In all my years of teaching this, everyone got 100% on exam zero. And exam zero is gonna count for five or seven and a half, seven and a half percent of the total grade. So again, some free points, okay? Now, in general, exams will be either of the handwritten type or entirely online. During COVID, like, uh, first when COVID hit and we were like all scrambling and trying to figure out what, what we're gonna do, uh, you know, I, I had a handwritten type exam, but then it was a total mess getting the documents back to me. So we switched entirely to online exams, but the online exams had very low stakes questions and a lot of them, like 50 questions. Each question was like 10 seconds long, right? With the handwritten exam, you'd have three, four problems. You'd spend a good 15, 20 minutes on each problem, 20 minutes on each problem, and you solve it. So this year, we're gonna return to the handwritten type exams. Okay, but maybe one of the exams is gonna be on the, of the online type. It depends on the feedback I'm getting from you on you know, how the learning is going. If it is of the online type, you'll get many questions, multiple attempts, but no partial credit. Because these are low stakes questions, there's no room for partial credit. It's either like, the, the answer is either yes or no. Not like maybe or, you know, or depends my mood on the more and the more. It's just like either yes or no or true or false, right? So no partial credit, but for handwritten exams, 
you're going to get a lot of partial credit because I'm going to look at every step you're taking. If you make a mistake, you'll lose maybe one point, but then I'll continue with the mistake that you committed and we'll assume it's all true. And, and questions, I do my best so that questions are independent of each other. Okay, and sometimes I'll tell you, hey, if you couldn't find the answer to question one, I'll give you the formula, you lose points on question one, I'll give you the formula, the answer, and then you can follow through with the remaining questions, okay? Um, exam zero, next Thursday, um, and I'll send you more information through Canvas. In all exams, you close books, close notes, so you can't use the slides, but you're allowed to bring in your um, no cheat, so it's a letter size, double sized, okay, you know, and it needs to be readable, like I, you don't have to get a magnifier to read, you know, normal font size, right? Um, you can write it, typeset it, however you like, um, and I will give you complex formulas in the, in, the, in the exam, so you don't have to worry about those. So your no cheats need, need to contain things that you couldn't remember or your iffy about, right? So you write those down on your note sheet, okay? So that will be for exam zero, one, and two. For the final exam, you will have two of those sheets because the final exam is generally comprehensive with more emphasis on the latter part of the semester. Each exam just covers the portion from the previous exam. So exam one only covers whatever material we did from exam zero to exam one, and exam two from all the material after exam one, etc. okay? All right, so I covered the partial credit policy for exams. This is today's tentative grading policy. It's been, it served us very well. It tries to balance um, different types of kind of trying to, to test your knowledge. Homework assignments, 25%. So if, you get, if we get, do 10 homeworks, um, 10 assignments, that means 2.5 points of the total grade per assignment. Um, prerequisite exam, that's a free 5%, free 5 points of your total, okay? So I, I look at that in a very positive way. Oh, exams on prerequisite, that's a free thing, right? These things I already know, right? Two midterm exams, 35%, quizzes 10%, and the final 25%, okay? Um, and these are the tentative um, letter grades that we will use. I, I generally do not curve, um, you know, your performance doesn't depend on other people's performance. Um, however, I look holistically at the course and um, I reserve, you know, some flexibility at the end in, you know, looking at individual cases. And what affects those things is looking at your individual progress, right? Like you're making progress. I see that you've made progress from exam one to exam two through the homework assignments. You know, you tried your best. Um, uh, participation helps. It's not necessary, but you know, all of those things, they, 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 I count those in. So looking holistically, not just at the numbers, okay? Um, I wanted to give a little perspective. Let me see. Um, Allow me a moment here. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to give some perspective on numerical methods before I change subjects. So, in, in general, what you learn in engineering and the foundation of engineering is what we call the fundamental conservation laws. Like, I don't know, conservation of uh, energy, right? Conservation of mass, conservation of momentum. Right, two cars hit each other or two billiard balls hit each other. You know, momentum is going to be conserved. Some of it is going to be dissipated, right? So those are the foundations of physics and engineering. Everything you're going to learn is going to, we're always going to go back, oh, conservation of momentum says this, conservation of energy says that, okay? And we typically have approximations and models of reality and those together, we use them to create what we call an algorithm, which is just a set of steps to um, to get an answer, okay? This could be, for example, a, an equation or um, a sequence of equations or formulas that you use to get an answer. Typically, so far, you've learned how to use that by hand or a calculator and you get a solution, right? Or you use numerical tools like Python and Excel and to solve those equations which might not be solvable by hand and 
numerical methods um, lives over here. So all chemical engineering courses, they will teach you conservation laws, approximations, and models. 1703 will teach you how to write a function in Python, in Excel, um, how to solve, how to plot, how to do things, right? Numerical methods lives here between we're going to assume that we know the formula for something. So in one of the problems we'll do, we're going to study heat transfer um, in, a, uh, in, in a wall, for example. There's a temperature outside this wall and temperature inside this wall. What's happening inside the wall, the material with the insulation? But I'm going to give you the equations. Others, other courses will teach you how to derive the equation. In this course, I'm going to just take the equations and solve them, show you how we solve them, OK? Um, I had some slides about um, kind of my group and how um, numerical simulation is pretty powerful. Uh, so historically, the scientific method starts with an observation. Uh, you know, the infamous story of Newton's uh, apple, you know, fell on his head. You know, that really didn't happen this way. It's more of a dramatization. The guy was probably thinking about this problem for 30 years, right? And then he had that aha moment, right? But you, have, you make an observation, you see something, okay? Then you come up with a hypothesis, okay? A hypothesis is a statement that is trying to explain a certain observation. So with the, with the, with the gravitational thing, the hypothesis was large objects have a gravitational force, this mysterious force that pulls things to them. That's a hypothesis. Now, how do you test the hypothesis? Okay, you go run experiments. Okay, you say, okay, if I drop things, they're going to accelerate or they're going to fall for closer to larger objects, they're going to fall faster. To closer to smaller objects, they're going to fall um, slower. And you run experiments, and then if things does, don't work, you go refine your hypothesis and back and forth and back and forth. Now, I have to take a side note here because many people confuse hypothesis with a theory. A theory is actually the result of a well-tested hypothesis, okay? So a theory is not actually something hypothesizing, right? So when someone says, oh, this is just a theory. No, a theory, something to be promoted to the rank of theory means it has been a hypothesis, it was tested, and now it's a theory that explains all the data. So when someone makes an accusation, oh, that's just a theory. No, a theory actually means that it's been tested and explains all the data. You should say it's just a hypothesis, okay? Just a side note. Hear that a lot with the um, lot of theories out there. Okay. But how do you experiment on things that you can't experiment on, like an exploding star, like supernova? Um, if you've done astronomy, I, I, uh, I was an astronomy buff. I love everything about astronomy and astrophysics and everything that had to do with the universe. And so supernovae were um, some of the best things um, I looked at in a telescope and just pictures. So, but how do you experiment on an exploding star or a black hole, right? You can't run an experiment on that. You can just observe, but then like, well, you can't even test the hypothesis on a supernova. The time scales of those can be like what? You write a letter to your grand, 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 grand children to observe that same star after a thousand years, what happened to it? You can't do that, okay? You cannot do that. That's the fact. You can't experiment in a hurricane, which is very unethical. <laughs> so, I mean, there are some models for hurricanes, but, you know, with water tanks, et cetera, but they're very limited, right? You can't see, like, the full destructive force of a hurricane um, in a water tank or a nuclear accident. Like, how do you, 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 you kill the, everyone, right? It's, it's really not doable, right? And so, um, but those are important things, right? Because we need to know what happens if there is a nuclear incident. I mean, think Chernobyl, um, think Fukushima, right? So we need to know, we need to be able to simulate, to look at me, I said simulate, right? So that's where numerical methods come in, okay? Um, so most of the time they're expensive, dangerous, or impossible. And then this is where simulation comes in. So I like to update the scientific model by adding this. So now we run experiments on complex things. We run experiments just to obtain like properties. For example, you know, what are the properties in certain gases in stars? 
right? What happens? We take those properties, we run little experiments, very limited, and then we use those properties, we input them to derive basic laws that we put, we derive very complex equations, right? And we put them together in a numerical simulation and let the simulation do it. So the calculations you saw for Abravanel Hall, um, those solve what we call the Navier-Stokes equations. They are, excuse me, a very complex set of partial differential equations, very nonlinear, very coupled, very difficult to solve. But there would have been no way to do those experiments without exposing everyone to COVID at the orchestra and running at different scenarios like, you know, play harder bassoon or play harder, you know, flute. We, we could change that very easily in the numerical simulation. It's just a number, just a value, right? And it was very safe to do it and it was very cheap, okay? So it's a new kind of science. Numerical methods is at the foundation of simulation science. So you could do simulate fluid mechanics, you could simulate heat transfer, or you could just talk to data and do statistics on data. One of the problems we'll solve is to predict the rate of um, COVID infections. So that was a problem we did during um, when the COVID pandemic hit, we were studying numerical differentiation and some statistics. So we did that, it was a fun problem to do. And then we developed with ordinary differential equations, we developed a model on COVID spread and infection and you know what happens if you get a vaccine and you know all of that we did it just with computers. Very powerful stuff, okay? I'll show you some eye candy from simulations um, um, that I did when you know a few years ago. This is a coal boiler. Um, so in a coal boiler what happens um, what you're looking at here are coal particles being injected tangentially into this box. Now, this is a small box about this big, okay? Um, and then what happens, the flow, they swirl and they burn in the middle, okay? And then you have exhaust gases coming out and exiting up the top. It's not, it's not that visible with this rendering, but check this out. Now, if you, I take this plane and I go send a robot to a real coal boiler to look inside what's happening, this is what you see, or a fireball. Okay, so coal particles come in and they immediately combust and they cause this swirling motion and the longer, the taller your combustor, the more energy is going to produce and those, this fire is heating these pipes along the edge which contain water, they are converted to steam, the steam runs a turbine and generates electricity, okay? Now this is so fast that even a picture like this with a standard shutter speed, one over 60 seconds, it looks like cotton candy, like it's very, because it's very fast, it's going really fast. Now I'm gonna superimpose my simulation on top of this. Okay, starting to move, starting to swirl, initial condition is picking up. I start picking up the motion. What the simulation provides me is the instantaneous motion second after second of what is happening in that coal boiler. And I can go and click on every pixel here and get a value for the temperature, for the concentration, for the oxygen concentration, for the energy, at any point in that, okay? Pretty powerful stuff. A lot of other simulations and things. Um, this was uh, other project with wave propagation, so this is a different kind of simulation. This was actually part of a project for the military. This is a helicopter flying into terrain, and we want to figure out if people standing here could hear the helicopter. Okay? And then the Utah Symphony project. Um, anyway, fun stuff. So you'll see those in the slides and when we uploaded that, when I upload those. Okay. Who's uh, feeling sleepy already? <laughs> okay, well, this, this particular lecture kind of lends itself to be sleepy, but my objective is my, in my teaching is to figure out how to solve this problem. <laughs> and then at the end, so everyone is attentive initially, it's exciting, there's this new guy teaching the class, and then, you know, and hey, this is me. I, if you cannot catch my attention in 10 minutes, I'm done. Like I go listen to a lot of seminars, a lot of talks, 
That's why I left TED Talks, like 10 minutes, you know, give me the answer, I'm done, wanna, wanna be out, I don't have time for you, right? And so I, I, I shouldn't expect anything less of you, right? Okay, so I, I, do, I get it. I'm listening to sometimes YouTube lectures and it just gets boring and boring and boring. And typically what we find is that within the first 10 minutes of the beginning of anything, this is kind of where we reach peak attention, okay? Um, and then, you know, by 15 minutes, typically attention, you start kind of drifting and thinking about other things and music and the video games and whatever other things are on you. That, that's, trust me, that's me. And so over the years, um, I, 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 I knew of this and I learned it somewhere that actually on YouTube, <laughs> okay? And there's a lot of evidence for this kind of approximation of what happens if you look at the attention versus time during a lecture. But what if we can do this? Ah, <laughs> right? So you'll get to kind of feel, by the time you get to feel bored a little bit or like sleepy, what, what can I do to engage you again, okay? I'm gonna do an activity. So you will see, as part of my teaching philosophy in this class, I adopt a method by Richard Felder, a chemical engineer, called active learning. So on Thursday, we'll split you on two groups. You'll put your group name out and your name on like little tags, and you'll give funny names to your group. So, you know, we add some humor to the activity, and then we'll have activities where we pose a problem and together as a group, you're gonna to try to solve that problem, discuss it, write a summary, and then we'll have a discussion amongst each other. So every now and then there's gonna be an activity to try to bring you back to life. Or there's gonna be a story, okay? Story that is relevant to the course, sometimes a little anecdote um, from personal experience, just to try to get you re-engaged, okay? Sometimes there's a summary, sometimes there's a break, right? So that's the plan. Overall, it's been working. You know, I mean, it's not 100% because it's an hour and a half long class. I mean, it's, it's exhausting. I get it. Okay. So, but there's a benefit in that you're getting immersed in the material for an hour and a half. You know, you're going to get the most of it. It's not like when I teach the one hour classes, it takes like 20 minutes to build up, 30 minutes to build up to a concept and then we have to leave, right? Or there's, you know, there's, there's barely enough time to cover something in depth. With an hour and 20 minutes, I have a chance to get you really immersed in something, okay? Then, you know, I might have a recap, et cetera, activity. And you notice my, my style, I pivot a lot and I walk a lot and I gesture. And I change my voice, it's like all Middle Eastern people, very loud and, you know, gesture. So that helps, right, to try to re-engage you, okay? So, and I, sometimes I do that on purpose. Right, so I go lower my tone. So that's on purpose, okay? To try to, try to bring you back to the class, okay? Um, okay, so hence my teaching philosophy. Uh -huh. Okay. So in general, I follow an inductive-based approach, especially for introductory classes. There are two approaches to teaching, induct inductive-based and deductive-based. In the deductive approach, I present to you with a general theory or general formula, and then you go and apply it to special cases. The inductive approach is the opposite. We're like we see something, oh, this is interesting. Let's observe more. Then we make another observation, and then another observation. It's like a child trying to experiment, you know, with uh, what happens to a mandarin if they drop it down the stairs in the new house, you know, on the carpet, right? And then it's gonna, or when, you know, my kid is trying to smush the, uh, the orange, right? Or the apple, right? So they, they're experimenting with gravity, with forces, right? And then they develop a model. So that's an inductive-based approach. And for introductory classes, for early classes, the research has shown it's more effective. And I like that because I personally learn like that. I want to learn from little examples where, like, yeah, yeah, I got this, I got this, and then what is the big theory behind this? So together, that's how the course is going to be like. We're going to do little examples, might seem boring, and then we'll make it a little bit harder, and then a little bit harder until we get to the big theory, right? And then you can take the theory, again, a theory is not a hypothesis. Theory explains a lot of observations, right? So we're going to take that big theory and apply it to different problems, right? So then we will be deductive after that. 
But the approach is going to be inductive. That's, that's, that's how I base all my lectures. When I'm preparing a lecture, I'm like, how can I get you started on assuming you know nothing about the material? Some things are going to be boring, okay, because you've seen them before. But I'll ask you to bear with me because it's, we're going to get to a point where it's challenging enough to challenge you and extend your knowledge. Active-based learning, we'll explain this more on Thursday. You will form into groups and we'll pose a problem. Your group will discuss it, try to solve it. And I will call on groups. Groups might volunteer, et cetera. Um, and I know sometimes um, I don't, I, I, I rarely call randomly on people unless you want to kind of participate. Um, but if you feel like, you know, I know it could be um, terrifying to some to be called upon, etc. I want you to be comfortable. I, I, I want you to be very comfortable in this class. If you don't like that, just send me an email. I'll put you on the no calling list until you change your mind, okay? You don't have to change your mind. But the advantage of, okay, let's, let's, put, let's put this fact out. At some point, in your job, you're going to have to stand in front of some colleagues or some people and tell them something. Okay? So I'd rather you do that in this class in a safe environment. Okay? We're not going to be judging each other. We're going to be exploring the ideas, how to answer it, how to tell it, how to analyze it. Okay? And I expect you to give wrong answers. If you don't do something wrong, you're not learning anything. Right? When I was trying to learn how to use the mitre saw, I was like hoping I don't cut my finger, right? But, you know, I, I, I learned quite a bit. I took my time. I made mistakes. And then I'm, I'm much better at it. So I hope that you will take that into consideration, okay? And attempt to participate. Take it, you know, um, one step at a time. And if you feel like, uh, you know, this terrifies you, or uh, just send me an email, okay? Put you on the no calling list and you know you can change your mind anytime you like it will not affect anything okay but i hope you consider it as a form of training for public speaking for presenting right we better do it right now in a you know no in a very low stakes environment rather than later okay my style in teaching is storytelling i love stories i love to tell stories okay so you'll see me walk around gesture etc and um, I do have hearing loss in, in this ear. So sometimes I can't hear you well, so I might get close to you. Again, some people don't feel comfortable with that. If you don't, let me know, okay? But it's, it's not personal. It's like I just want to hear you better. Or sometimes if you're wearing a mask, like, you know, it attenuates the volume. I can't hear well. So feel free to maybe take off your mask if you want. Um, and, but, you know, I'm going to be walking around the class. Now, when there are coding activities, I'm going to be walking around, but again, it's not like when I'm walking around, I'm, I, I barely have time to look at the details of what you're doing, right? So I'm really not paying attention to what you're doing, but I'm walking around and I see like, yeah, if you're not typing, then maybe you need my help and you just didn't want to ask for help, right? So I hope that you will be comfortable to ask for help. Just say, you know, just do this, for example, I'll come up and we can go through it. Sometimes it takes a moment to fix something, okay? It's good for you to try to solve it, but sometimes you just be spinning your wheels because there's something that was entirely out of your control. Maybe the Jupyter Notebook is not connected to the CHPC server or whatever, right? Oh, I can fix that in a second and then um, you're up and running, okay? All right. Some survival tips. Um, this class is about numerical methods and not programming. So again, I'm not teaching you how to program here. I would love to have a course on programming only, but that's not this course. This would turn into like an eight credit course. Okay, so in the prerequisites, we expect you to know some Python. Okay, now that Python is very basic. Okay, and I will provide you with enough material to get through the initial um, phase if you haven't done Python before, but it seems many of you have done, which is great. And I do encourage you to help each other and even like share codes, but rewrite it, okay? Um, but this class is not about programming. Now, to do serious and numerical methods, you need programming. That's like the conundrum, right? But I cannot teach both, okay? And I cannot, I don't have the time to do both. However, numerical methods is going to be your first class where you see the power of programming. 
okay? Because there are problems that you cannot solve by hand or by calculator or in Excel. You're gonna need program, you're gonna need Python, MATLAB. Uh, there's reasons why we choose Python. Um, so you need to brush up on your programming skills um, uh, right now. I will give you the material, um, a lot of material on Python. Um, there's a lot of resources in the syllabus and resources that I created and some of my colleagues created in the department. They're all at your disposal. And typically, the first couple of homework assignments, everyone is up and running with Python. It's like just throwing you in the water and, you know, you'll figure it out. And then by your third year, fourth year, you're going to become an expert programmer because then you get a chance to focus on optimizing your code, OK? Um, we'll work together on improving your skills, um, but you have to make a serious effort to learn. So in a way, it's funny, the word, you know, what do you expect when you go take a class, right, from a teacher? Uh, I, I, can't, I can't put learning in your mind, right? You are responsible for your own learning. All I can do is be a vessel to say, look, this material is important. I will take down all the barriers for you to learn this material, but you have to put the time to learn it, right? I can, my brother used to tell me how to drive a stick shift car, etc. but it wasn't until I spent serious time in the car, you know, running it, you know, into the wall a couple of times, and I figured out how to use the clutch and, you know, change the gear, etc. right? So you have to commit that effort. You have to put that effort. Otherwise, you're not going to learn, because I can't teach you that. My job is to just, Pass on the information in the most effective way that I try to do, okay? But then the rest rely, relies on you, okay? Um, I'll post lecture notes before um, the class. Uh, so as you'll see, we're going to start on errors on Thursday. So I'll put the PDF on the lecture, the lecture notes on Canvas. You can review it. You can, before coming to class, just glance at it. Half of the story is being exposed to the nomenclature. The other half is understanding what that nomenclature means. That's quite a bit, just looking at being exposed to the nomenclature, OK? Um, before doing homework, um, try to rework the examples we did in class. And if you are stuck, get help, OK? Um, so from the TAs, from me. But don't expect us to do the homework for you. You'll see that you come and ask how I do this. Our answer is going to be, what do you think? <laughs> you know, it's going to be like, oh, gosh, right? So, you know, we're, we're going to work with you to try to show you that you can actually get to figuring out the answer yourself, okay? But um, come and seek help, okay? These student hours and the help sessions, they're for you, okay? They're dedicated for you. Just feel free to come in and just drop by, okay? Um, some homework thoughts. I... Uh, I really don't care about you getting an answer. So here's, here's, a, here's a, a little tip. On, on several exams, actually a story that happened with me, and I learned that from my teacher of heat transfer. Um, we had this uh, example of two spherical balls in outer space. They are both radiating heat, each one at 1,000 Kelvins. And I was asked to get the temperature in the middle and my answer was like 100 million Kelvins. And I wrote down, this doesn't make sense. He gave me full credit. Turns out I had a mistake in the Boltzmann constant, OK? But that statement, this doesn't make sense, that's what I'm after, OK? That's what I'm after, especially on exams. You're short on time. You get an answer, like, this, is, this isn't right. There's something wrong here. I must have made a mistake. And you know, I'll be very generous. And I appreciate that. That's, that's what I'm after. So the goal is not to get the answer. It clearly, you know, you want to get an answer eventually, right? But as you train your brain muscle to do this critical thinking, you'll be able to tell when you're on the wrong path, OK? Writing code is, is not the goal. I don't care if you write 2,000 lines of code to solve the problem or two lines of code. As long as it runs and does, gets the job done, um, I'm happy with that, OK? Um, this is a tip about engineers. How you present your results is often as important as the results themselves. So how you analyze your results, how you think about them, how you put them in context, right? So a great way, a great tip when you're explaining something, when you're explaining a number, um, is to try to compare it to something people know about, right? Like, this is the size of 100 football fields. Like, oh my gosh, right? Suddenly, you know, you have that... Um, 
set in your mind, right? Because you know how big a football field is. It's just an example, okay? All right. Now on to programming. Um, this slide used to be quite relevant um, early on when I was trying to do the switch from MATLAB to Python. Um, when it comes to programming, there are two things. There's the programming language and there's the programming thought. Okay, the language is nothing more than clothing on the thought. Because the thought can be expressed, just like I, I'm thinking now, and I can express my thought in French or in Spanish, right, or in Japanese. But it's the same thought, right? So that's the same thing with programming. A programming thought or an algorithm can be expressed in MATLAB, in Python, in C++, in C. What is more important is figuring out that thought or that algorithm. What do I want to do first? I have a bunch of data that I need to interpolate, but to do a linear interpolation, I need to sort the data increasingly from small to large. Ah. How do I sort an array in Python or in MATLAB or in C++? Then you just Google that. Okay? If you don't know how to sort, I don't know how to sort array off the top of my mind. I'm just going to go and Google it. There's disk space here that is going to contain more important information like your names. I'd rather have your names in my mind than how to sort an array because I can always Google that. But I want you to get to that thought, to know what you need to do before you program. Oh, I need to sort the array. Okay, how do I sort this? Okay, here's the, met here's the method. And then go, go Google it. You learn some new syntax that might stick in your mind, which is great. If not, but now you know. Then on to the next step. After I sort the array, I need to apply a linear interpolant. How to apply a linear interpolant, right? So two steps, separate the programming thought from the programming language. Because once you know the thought, you can express it in any language you, you want. I don't want to teach you Python for the sake of Python, right? I don't want you to do Python for the sake of Python. Python just happens today to be, you know, the uh, hot language on the block, right? But in a few years, something else is going to replace it. And you will be equally capable of programming in any other language because you need to understand how to formulate the thought for the programming, okay? Okay, so this, is, this explains this, um, this discussion, okay? Um, why did I choose Python? Why did we choose Python? Because it's free, forever, it's open source. It is, if you look at um, jobs on indeed.com or IEEE um, job market, there's like hundreds of thousands of jobs that are asking for Python. So we feel comfortable that we are giving you the right tools. When you graduate, you have the right tools in your, in your pocket, okay? Um, it's very easy to get started with Python. And Python is in high demand, like I said. And it's very forgiving. Like sometimes I've added arrays that don't make sense. It just works and just happened to just work, being lucky. You know, now sometimes that could be problematic, but it's kind of nice to know that you're working with a friendly language that is not going to punish you like C++. C++, if you make a mistake in the data type, you're like, it crashes, gives you like weird errors and segmentation for like, I have no idea what's going on. Python is very forgiving. I love Python for that, okay? Um, the best feature of Python is you can use it in a web browser. So early on, now most of you already have Jupyter Notebooks and Python installed, which is great. But five years ago, six, six years ago, this was not the case. And when I told my students, look, you don't even have to install anything. Just go to this website link, ondemand.chpc.utah.edu, and you can program there. Oh, that's great, right? You don't even have to install anything because they could work on it from any terminal, from any laptop, from any computer. All right, so there will be two ways to access Python. So these are quite well described here, but also we will work through them in the help sessions, okay, and in the activities in class. But there are two ways that we will access Python. The first one is via your web browser, browser and the Center for High Performance Computing at the University of Utah. So uh, we worked with, the, with CHPC to have them install an instance of Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Hub, essentially, 
So for those of you who are new to Python, who don't want to install anything on their machines, it's like, this is all new, I just want something that works right now, you can just go and sign up to a user account at CHPC and just follow this instruction to sign up. You'll create an account and then you'll be able to access your Python from the CHPC website. Okay? Now, many of you already have Python installed, so this, will, this slide will be irrelevant, but I will work with you if you're trying to set this up, okay? The second way is to access Python to download it on your own. You can get one of the most popular distributions called the Anaconda distribution, just Google Anaconda Python. Installation rules are different for Windows, Linux, and, and Mac, so I leave that up to you to figure that out, but once you, it's fairly easy, you install it and you have it up and running, okay? Again, it's your responsibility to learn Python. I will show you tips and tricks and techniques, okay, in the, as we work through the problems. But it's on you to learn Python. Now, thankfully, most of you went through 1703. You've had expo good exposure to Python. Um, and, you know, it was Tony B and myself who were behind this entire mess that we got the department into Python early on in 2017. We were having dinner in, um, we were, uh, was it San, San Francisco, I think? In, at the AICHE conference, and we're like, hey, here's a great idea. Let's just turn everyone into Python. And so, um, you know, you can th thank us for that. Thank Tony Butterfield Morgan. <laughs> okay. Um, these are some tips for solving hom homework. Um, I kind of. So, in most of the cases, this will work. This is a recipe that works. Ask yourself, what am I after? Am I after the temperature at that point? Am I after um, the slope at that point, right? Clearly identify what you're after. Keep that at the top of your scratch sheet, right? Then write down a solution procedure or the steps or whatever we learned in class to get to that point. If you want to do the derivative or if you want to calculate the temperature, then you need to solve that system of equations. Once you solve the system of equations, you need to interpolate it to that point to be able to find the temperature. Okay. So write those steps and then go and implement them. Go and implement them. Now, in many cases, and you will see I use this approach when programming, when I'm implementing a new function to calculate a derivative or to calculate a uh, standard deviation or a regression line, I test it on something I know. I test it on something that I have the answer to analytically to make sure it runs and gives me the right answer, give, gives me some confidence that my function is working correctly. Okay, so you do that before you try to solve the big problem. Okay, again, inductively build it step by step to get to that point. Okay? Um, we're going to have plenty, ample opportunity to talk about this procedure called um, code verification. Okay. Um, this should do it for today. Um, on Thursday, I will go briefly over um, motivation for Python and programming, and we'll get started on error analysis, okay? Thank you, and uh, good luck for the semester, okay? Pleasure having you all here.